This is Lesson 732, The Protestant Reformation. Our history quote for the day comes from Martin Luther himself. Blood alone moves the wheels of history. Interesting side note, in the TV show The Office, Dwight Schrute actually gave a speech in which he said this quote. He attributed that quote to Mussolini because it was funny. But it was not said by Mussolini. Originally, it was said by Martin Luther. What did he mean by that? Well, what he meant was that history is moved by bloodshed, battles, wars, violence. And the Protestant Reformation had plenty of all of those things. And it wasn't that Martin Luther wanted to see those things, but as far as he was concerned, that was just life. Causes of the Protestant Reformation. Well, for one thing, you, of course, you had the Hundred Years' War and the Black Death, and these undermined the church's credibility. Also, there were scientific advances which contradicted the beliefs that were taught by the church. And there was a great deal of corruption within the Catholic Church. What was the Protestant Reformation? Prior to the Reformation, all Christians in Western Europe were Roman Catholic. The Reformation was an attempt to reform the Catholic Church. That's where we get the word Reformation. And people like Martin Luther wanted to get rid of all that corruption and restore the people's faith in the Catholic Church. In the end, these reformers, people like Martin Luther and John Calvin, wound up breaking away from the Catholic Church and establishing their own religions and attracting people to those new religions. This Reformation caused a splintering in all of Christianity with the formation of these new Protestant religions. As the Protestant Reformation continued, you had Christianity split between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. The Reformers, we're going to look at three, but there were actually quite a few. We're going to look at Martin Luther, John Calvin, and we're also going to look at King Henry VIII. Let's start with Martin Luther. When Martin Luther showed up, he found an audience that was ready for his message. Martin Luther's background, he lived from 1483 to 1546. And Martin Luther was the son of a wealthy copper mine owner. His family had been peasants just one generation before. And Martin Luther's father had wanted him to be a lawyer. But a sudden powerful religious experience caused Martin Luther to quit law school and go to an Augustinian monastery. And his dad was not happy about that, but there wasn't much he could do about it. And Martin Luther became a priest. Martin Luther got his doctorate in theology in the year 1512. And he became a lecturing professor of theology at the University of Wittenberg. This upstart University of Wittenberg was small and new and not very famous. But Martin Luther was an excellent biblical scholar and lecturer. His biblical knowledge was highly advanced. Luther always felt insecure about his own personal salvation. And he became very troubled over the possibility of dying and not going to heaven. And Martin Luther turned to the Bible and confessioned for comfort. And in the Bible, Martin Luther believed that he had found the answers he was looking for. In the book of Romans 1.17, he found the words, the righteous will live, in other words, be saved and go to heaven, by faith. And he found similar statements in Romans 3.23-24, through 24, Romans 3.28, Romans 6.23, Galatians 2.16, Galatians 3.11, Galatians 3.24, and Ephesians 2.8-9. Martin Luther took these statements to clearly mean that only a person's faith in Jesus and his grace could save a person and get him or her into heaven. Good deeds, good works, rituals, etc. could not save a person. And it also meant that you cannot earn or pay your way into heaven. Therefore, salvation through faith in Jesus was a free gift from God and could not be earned. I like this picture. It's actually kind of funny, but it's also doctrinally accurate. The Indulgence Controversy. A Dominican friar named Johann Tetzel 
was coming through Martin Luther's area in Wittenberg and selling these things called indulgences to people. Half the money he raised was going to the Pope in Rome to build the huge St. Peter's Basilica. These indulgences were paper certificates that you could purchase from the church for money that said that you had paid for certain sins. You could even pay to get a dead friend or a dead relative to heaven faster. And this is a picture of a stamped pre-printed indulgence with blanks in it so that you could insert your name when you bought this. The other half of the money was going to the Archbishop of Mainz. Albert of Brandenburg had bought the position of Archbishop of Mainz and buying an important position like this is a form of corruption called simony. The position was a very powerful one because it was the chair of a group of high nobles called the electorate. And this electorate got to elect the Holy Roman Emperor, who always seemed to be from the Habsburg family. Albert of Brandenburg had borrowed tons of money from bankers to buy this extremely important position. He didn't get there by his own merit. He didn't earn the position. He bought the position. Half the money that people were paying for these indulgences was being used to pay off his loans. The 95 Theses, 1517. Martin Luther, appalled by all of this hypocrisy, wrote a list of 95 errors that he felt the church was making. His main target was the sale of these indulgences, but he also criticized other things that he felt the church was wrong about. The power of the Pope, for example, and the extreme wealth of the church. And Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church. And this was kind of the traditional thing that you did when you had something important to announce to the community. Everybody goes through the door of the church, so everybody's going to see your announcement. Martin Luther's 95 Theses ignited an immediate firestorm. Copies in the form of pamphlets were printed and distributed throughout the area. And what you see here is the power of the printing press, which had been invented in the 1450s, just a few decades before. The Pope, Leo X, was pretty easygoing about it at first. And he was actually the son of Lorenzo Medici, Lorenzo the Great, who had ruled Florence during the height of the Italian Renaissance. In other words, Pope Leo X had gotten his position, his papacy, through another form of corruption called nepotism. Nepotism means getting a position through family connections rather than earning it. Pope Leo X saw the whole 95 Theses thing as an internal squabble that had little to do with him. But Martin Luther, back at home, was becoming something of a folk hero. Pope Leo X finally ordered Martin Luther to repent of his beliefs in the year 1520. And Martin Luther refused. And then Pope Leo X excommunicated Martin Luther in 1521. In other words, kicked him out of the church. And Martin Luther's response was to publicly burn his excommunication notice. The recently elected Holy Roman Emperor was the 21-year-old Charles V. He was actually the grandson of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain. And he was a staunch defender of Catholicism. And Charles V believed that he had a full-blown heretic on his hands whose name was Martin Luther. So Charles V called Martin Luther to the Diet of Worms in the spring of 1521, hoping to get Martin Luther to see the error of his ways. The Diet of Worms was a large representative body from the entire Holy Roman Empire whose purpose was to advise and counsel Charles V. Martin Luther showed up and defied the Diet of Worms. Love this picture. This is a picture of him defying the Diet of Worms. Three things happened then. First, Martin Luther was already as communicated, so that situation wasn't going to get any better. Second, Charles V also declared Martin Luther to be not just a heretic, but an outlaw. Martin Luther's books were burned, and Martin Luther himself might have been burned. But Frederick III, Elector of Saxony, took Martin Luther under his protection. 
he literally intercepted the procession that was carrying Martin Luther to prison. Now, technically, Luther was one of Frederick's own subjects because Luther lived in Saxony. So you could say that Frederick III was well within his rights. Frederick III didn't like the way the Holy Roman Emperor interfered with his local affairs in Saxony. And so Frederick III let Martin Luther work, create the first German New Testament, and literally form his new church under his personal protection. Acceptance of reforms. Some local German churches accepted Luther's ideas, and these ideas came to be known as Lutheranism. These churches formed the Lutheran Church. Luther's work was supported by German princes who issued a formal protest against the church for suppressing the reforms. And these reformers came to be known as Protestants, Protestants. John Calvin. Here's a quote from John Calvin that says a lot about him. May little chickens dig out your eyes a hundred thousand times. This was Calvin speaking to another reformer whose ideas he disagreed with. John Calvin was extremely anti-Catholic. He was influenced by Martin Luther, but he was also his own man, and he disagreed with Luther's salvation through faith alone doctrine. He created his own Protestant religion in the city of Geneva in Switzerland, and this religion would be called Calvinism. John Calvin and predestination. Here's what the idea of predestination meant. Calvin believed that God already knows absolutely everything past, present, and future. And therefore, God must already know all of the following. Number one, who is going to heaven? People who are going to heaven, he called the elect. And who is going to hell? And the people who are going to hell were called the reprobate. In theory, you can't really know which one you are. But in practice, it seemed pretty obvious to any Calvinist who was going to heaven and who was going to hell. These are John Calvin's own words on the subject of predestination. He said this, By predestination, we mean the eternal decree of God by which he determined with himself whatever he wished to happen with regard to every man. All are not created on equal terms, but some are preordained to eternal life, others to eternal damnation. And accordingly, as each has been created for one or the other of these ends, we say that he has been predestinated to life or to death. John Calvin and the elect. If you bought into Calvin's beliefs, then the city of Geneva was a paradise for you, and people flocked to Geneva from all over Europe to join Calvin's community. But if you didn't buy into Calvin's beliefs, then the city of Geneva was a living hell for you. Transgressors, in other words, sinners, were punished publicly and severely. The spread of Calvinism. John Calvin wrote a book in 1536 called The Institutes of the Christian Religion. This was the textbook on how to do Protestant church, and it was extremely popular. John Calvin was an international hero. And Calvinism was spreading like wildfire to places like France, where they were called Huguenots, and England, and Scotland, etc. So why was Calvinism so popular? Because Calvinism was super simple and crystal clear. It gave simple answers to complex questions. It was all either yes or no, wrong or right, no gray areas. And this was a time of great uncertainty with other church institutions. Calvinism could also go anywhere and put down roots easily. All you needed to form a Calvinist church was a Bible and a copy of the Institutes of the Christian Religion, and you were in business. A third reason, everyone who buys in is part of the elect. Have you ever met a Calvinist who didn't think he was part of the elect? Of course not. Number four, city officials were attracted to Calvinism. Why? 
it gave them more power over their people because there was no clergy to compete with. There's no papacy in Rome to have to deal with. There's no Catholic prince to have to deal with. And it was a way to differentiate themselves from those landed nobles who oppressed everybody. Different names, same beliefs. It started in Switzerland where they were called Calvinists. But in England, Calvinists were called Puritans. Sound familiar? In Scotland, they were called Presbyterians. In Holland, they were called Dutch Reformists. And in France, they were the Huguenots. In Germany, they were the Reform Church. Different names, but it's all really Calvinism. Because of Calvinism, Christianity split yet again among the Protestants. See, Christianity was now split between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, which had further fragmented into Lutheranism and Calvinism. And that was just the start of all the fragmentation. 